Among the F-A-18's most lethal air-to-air -air weapons is the Raytheon AMRAAM, or Advanced Medium-Range Air-to-Air Missile. The AMRAAM is capable of being launched at well beyond visual ranges in any weather, day or night. Its low-smoke, high-impulse rocket motor reduces the chance of enemy sighting and evasion, while its 45-pound warhead can take out any plane in existence. The AMRAM self-contained active radar seeker allows the F-A-18 pilot to maneuver immediately after launch without disrupting the missile's path to its target. Just as deadly as the AMRAM is the AIM-9X Sidewinder. The Sidewinder's strength is for shorter ranges than the AMRAM. Its tracking device features a 180-degree periscope-like infrared seeker that can spot and chase targets. The AIM-9X earned the name Sidewinder with its vectoring rocket motors, which allow right-angle turns. Pilots fire and sometimes even steer these weapons from the F-A-18's cockpit. What makes these weapon systems all the more lethal is a cockpit design with a heads-up display that allows the pilot to perform many functions without looking down. Close three, one, go. Close three, one, have a tanker down south. And almost every task a pilot needs to perform can be done without having to take his hands off the controls. Well, the biggest thing to note is the hands-on throttle and stick, or HOTES. I mean, everything, you can do everything with just on, with, your, with your fingers all they're on the stick and throttle. Where the Tomcat was more user intensive, had to push a lot of buttons, take your hands off the throttle or take your hands off the stick to do certain things. And in the front of the Tomcat, you had very limited capability as far as what kind of radar modes you were in and what kind of stuff you could do. Uh, the Hornet, from the front, you basically can do everything. With the FA-18's advanced cockpit design and fly-by-wire control system, the pilot has more flexibility than in any other Navy jet. What this aircraft becomes when you go airborne, or even prior to going airborne, it becomes more or less an extenuation of your actual body. I mean, you become a part of this jet. You become one with the jet. What these displays allow you to do is uh, find a, a mechanism or a conduit through which you can best glean all that information off, and you can incorporate that into your decision-making process while you're airborne. You get very comfortable hopping into this thing, starting it up, and, and launching off the front end of the carrier with it. To get this comfortable with their planes, future F-A-18 pilots spend over 50 hours in a flight simulator at NAS Lemoore. It recreates almost exactly the cockpit and flight characteristics of the F-A-18. This state-of-the-art equipment enables air crews to virtually fly every scenario. We'll initially start our training here with uh, just basic flight procedures, and as the training progresses, we'll learn different weapon systems, how to, how to fight the airplane air to air, and how to uh, use it air to ground. And uh, eventually, we'll end up flying at the boat with this. The final test that future Hornet pilots face in the simulator prepares them for one of the most difficult tasks in naval aviation, landing on the deck of an aircraft carrier. The minute you take off until, until you get on the carrier, that's all you're thinking about is, uh, is that landing. You can't replicate that. The simulator does the best you can, but there isn't the feeling of fear, the feeling of death, or the excitement, or the adrenaline. It doesn't come through your system in the simulator. But what this will do is give you muscle memory. When the adrenaline does start pumping through your body and, and the excitement, you start thinking about what you did in the simulator. After simulated carrier landings, pilots get even closer to the real thing. This is Lemoore's landing signal area complete with arresting cables, distance markers, and even the identical landing lights pilots use as a guide to touch down on the carrier successfully. We're here at NAS Lemoore on uh, runway 32 left at the, uh, just outside the LSO shack. Uh, behind me, you can see the optical landing system, uh, the Fresnel lens, which uh, provides the pilot a uh, optical reference for how high or low he is below a uh, glide slope. And that's uh, real important because the plane has to land at the proper spot on the carrier. The LSO, landing signal officer, he stands at the back of the boat, and he's in a verbal communication with the, uh, with the pilots via the radio. But he also uses this, the, uh, the pickle. This controls the lens. Pushing this button uh, illuminates the red wave-off lights. So that's, uh, that would indicate that the landing area is uh, fouled, like there's another aircraft in there, or personnel. Uh, and also the cut lights here, you can give them a, uh, by using the cut lights, 
it's uh, another nonverbal way that the LSO can uh, communicate to the pilot that he wants him uh, to give a little bit of power to uh, come up on glide slope a little bit. The runway at Lemoore's Reeves Field stretches for 13,500 feet, giving pilots plenty of landing room. On a Nimitz-class carrier, the landing strip is just 500 feet long. To bring an F-A-18 to a complete stop, the pilot has to grab or trap one of four arresting cables. That means dropping the plane into a 40-foot box, ideally just two feet in front of the wire. Without some sort of arresting device, the jet would skid right off. Flying in at a minimum of 150 knots to avoid engine stall, F-A-18 pilots aren't so much landing the plane as aiming it at the wire. As soon as he touches down, the pilot revs his engine in case he slips the wire. If he misses, he takes off, circling around to try again. During the day, the pilot can at least see the deck. At night, the carrier turns off all but a few lights to avoid becoming an easy target for enemies. Liquid vapor torches cast just small pools of light. The rest of the flight deck remains as dark as possible. From three miles away, the carrier looks like a pinprick of light. There's no way to tell which direction it's moving, and the fatigued pilot's eyes can easily play tricks on him. Pilots returning at night have often been aloft on missions as long as six hours. The extra fatigue leads to a greater chance of missing the wire. You're fatigued. Uh, you've had a lot of excitement, adrenaline high, adrenaline low, probably hungry, tired, all that. At night, you don't really look at the carrier except for maybe the last uh, 10 seconds of the approach or something like that. It's just an instrument approach. Um, you have a set of needles, one for lineup, one for glide slope, and you're just uh, keeping those things centered up. Like magic, there's the boat, and uh, you just fly a touchdown. So uh, it's all instrument work, pretty much. And uh, if you keep that thing centered and you keep the attitude on the jet, then you'll uh, grab a three-wire every time. 